welcome to this webinar that we have titled, What We Are Learning About the Church from Calvin University Students. My name is Joanna Wigboldy. I'm a program manager at the Worship Institute. I am on the Vital Worship Grants team, but I also lead a program called the Ministry Leadership Cohort. The Ministry Leadership Cohort is for first and second year students at Calvin University. In the cohort, we explore how each student's unique gifts and experiences intersect with the life of the church, regardless of um, what their vocational aspirations are. We have students from a wide variety of majors of church backgrounds with a wide variety of gifts. And we uh, come together to build community, practice leadership, and love the church through classes, through small groups, through church visits, and lots of other activities. I'm delighted to be joined by these wonderful Calvin students today. Each of them has uh, some association with the ministry leadership cohort, but they also have a wide variety of other experiences that shape who they are and what they've brought to the cohort. And I want you to hear and see how we do that in the ministry leadership cohort and at Calvin more broadly. One of the hallmarks of the ministry leadership cohort is that we learn from the unique way that God has made each one of us, and we bring that together in order to have a richer whole. Um, so we do have a wide variety of students in the cohort. Let me briefly introduce our these particular students uh, so you get a sense of that. Rebecca Cross is a senior at Calvin. She is completing her Calvin journey. She's a, a peer leader for the ministry leadership cohort this year. And we're excited to learn from um, from her reflections on nearly four years at Calvin. Saina Tadasi is a first year student. So on the opposite end of the spectrum, she has been at Calvin for just a semester and a semester in which she could not actually go to churches in person. And yet we um, are thrilled to hear the ways that that semester, the experiences of that single semester have already begun shaping her journey and experience with the church. Kip DeMann and Fisher Pham are both sophomores in the ministry leadership cohort. And what's interesting about these two is that they have uh, similar experiences on paper. And yet they have different personalities, different gifts, different backgrounds. Um, and so they, what they've learned from those, what they bring to the whole um, on, from those different experiences, it enriches the whole as well. And so I wanted you to see what that looks like, um, how we all bring something different to the ministry leadership cohort. And then, of course, to the church, um, that we are richer in the church when we have lots of different gifts and experiences. I'm going to let each of these students um, kind of reintroduce themselves by sharing their church background and what they have been involved in at during their time at Calvin, whether that's on campus or off campus, that has shaped their understanding of church. So Fisher, I was hoping you would um, lead us off. Tell us about your church background and what you've been involved in that's shaped your experience of the church and your understanding of the church. Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up in a, uh, in a Baptist church, uh, very evangelical contemporary worship. Um, I went there all my life until last year. Um, I, I didn't really have any reason to leave the church besides the fact that there weren't very many service opportunities. Um, and I view service as a very integral part of being in the church. Um, and I really wanted to find a church that had more opportunities to serve. Um, and I really wanted to look for something specifically in musical worship, uh, because that's what I'm studying as part of my, uh, my minor, my uh, congregational ministry studies minor. So um, I was looking for an opportunity there. And through Calvin, through another Calvin student, I got connected with um, the church that I go to now, which is a small Orthodox Presbyterian church plant. Um, and uh, it used to meet at the Prince Conference Center. Now it meets off campus. Um, and at the time that I started uh, worshiping there, I wouldn't have considered myself a Presbyterian. I was still kind of hanging on to the title of a Baptist. Um, 
over many conversations with uh, with my pastor, particularly about infant baptism, I've now kind of switched denominations officially and um, consider myself an Orthodox Presbyterian. Um, and Calvin has, my experiences at Calvin have uh, really enhanced my understanding of, of church in a lot of ways. Um, so even though I'm a biochemistry major, so not really, uh, my primary studies aren't really in that that field. Uh, I am part of the ministry leadership cohort and studying for a ministry minor. So I've had a lot of opportunities to um, primarily experience other types of worship that I, that I didn't even know about before coming here. Um, before I started attending Calvin, I didn't know, I barely knew anything about any other denomination. Um, I didn't even know that church government beyond the local church was a thing until, until starting classes here. Um, so, I mean, whether it was, uh, doing church visits with the cohort or studying various liturgies in my music and worship class, um, or even attending last year's worship symposium, um, my experiences at, at Calvin have really, uh, just broadened my, my knowledge of other denominational, um, worship practices. Uh, and I could go into a dozen different ways about how that broadening, um, has affected my understanding of the church, but that's really the biggest way that Calvin has, that my experiences at Calvin have uh, shaped me is just by that broadening of my experiences. Great. Thank you. That That's, as a leader of the ministry leadership cohort, that's one of my main goals in that first semester is to broaden people's experiences. So Kip, uh, can you share what your experience, church background has been like, and then your experience at Calvin? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my story is, yeah, it's much like Fisher's. I think before I, I delve into the specifics of, you know, sort of the context and the denomination, I think it's important to say that I, I grew up homeschooled. I was homeschooled all the way up until college. And what that meant for me is that I didn't have social groups that weren't church related. Um, I didn't have extracurriculars that weren't um, with my Christian friends or at the church I went to. And so there was really no division between my social and my religious identity. Um, and I think that that's important to say because I, much like Fisher, went to the same church for the first 17 years of my life. And it was a church that was really focused on internal discipleship. And that was great for me because I had lots of extra time. And like I said, not a lot of extracurriculars. Um, so we were super invested in this Baptist megachurch for decades, um, my family and I were. And then uh, a couple years ago, we had sort of a, a social and ideological fallout with the church um, and had to transition out of it. And uh, frankly, it's been sort of the defining experience of my life, I think, just because I didn't have an identity that wasn't rooted in that church and I didn't know what to believe when I wasn't in that church. I didn't know who my friends were when I wasn't in that church. Um, so we transitioned out of that big Baptist, rich mega church into this tiny little, you know, 250 person OPC in a, a poor part of Grand Rapids. So we really couldn't have chosen something more different than um, our previous experience. And I think that that, um, that gave us an opportunity to sort of rest and also re-examine the church as a whole and understanding that it is diverse and it's different and you know much like Fisher said I think that that has been um you know the the more defining thing that I've learned both in my time at Calvin and in that transition out is embracing um the diversity within the church and the multiple different ways of doing it um in addition to um you know that church switch um, I think that this pandemic and not really being um, physically in a church uh, should go um, on the list of things that sort of define my church background and having to sort of sit back and um, really think about what it means to be in a church when we aren't physically together. Um, so, and as far as things that Calvin that I've been involved in that have shaped my experience, uh, the, the ministry leadership cohort has been huge. Um, just as I've gotten to know um, 
a lot of people, a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of diversity of opinion. And, you know, sometimes that's challenging, but I think it's been a really great challenge for me to see the different ways that people come at um, doing this whole church thing. And I really appreciated that. In addition, I am a Barnabas. So I'm a Bible study leader uh, in, in the dorms. And I've appreciated that for similar reasons, just seeing the different um, themes or verses or ideas that stick out to people in scripture as we sort of digest it together. Thanks. Sana, tell us about your experience. Just um, Okay, yes. Mine has been a little different because I, up until I was 13 or 14 years old, I was raised in Ethiopia. Um, and so the church establishment and everything about it was um, quite different than what you would see in the United States. Um, I went to a church called um, Ethiopian Evangelical Mekana Yesus, which is basically you can compare it with a Lutheran church here. Um, um, but doctrinally, it was quite different. So when I um, moved to the United States, I went to um, a church called Discovery. It's in um, Cutlerville, I think. Um, I was there for about two years, um, and then I moved to La Grave, where I'm a member of right now. Um, both of them are CRC. Um, during my time there, um, the things that I was involved in basically involved um, children's ministry and worship, um, which also kind of paved a way for me to be involved at my school, Calvin Christian High School, um, to lead worship there as well. Um, and I think when I um, moved to college, my expectations were, if it was a normal year, to be involved as much um, on the music aspect of it. But the fact that I was in ministry leadership cohort um, kind of changed a lot of my perspective on that too. Um, I was able to become more intentional about the time that I seek um, God during my day. Um, as a biochem student who I came in de deciding to be a biochem, um, but there wasn't really much time for me to think of my relationship with God as much intentionally. Um, so when I joined the ministry leadership cohort, um, it kind of led me into this, like, broader, like Fisher and Kip said, um, understanding of, oh, worship can be like multiple different things. Like it doesn't have to be where I am um, gathered with other people who have the same intentions as I am. My studies could be um, basically that worship as well. Can you tell us a little bit, Thena, about um, other like informal or formal worship experiences you've engaged with at Calvin? Yes. Um, so it was mainly Bible studies on my floor um, and sometimes chapel, like watching in between um, my classes. And the other thing is my uh, friends and I started this um, worship group. It's not really a worship group, but we would meet once a week um, and we would talk about um, what well, one person would play the guitar. And so we kind of said, why don't we start just a um, worship night once a week so we can gather together and sing together. And so we started this um, Friday night um, to just like come together in, either in the basement of a dorm or at the dock in the Calvin um, Eco Preserve. And we would just sing together for an hour, an hour and a half. And that would be just the perfect way to spend um, and kind of meet God in that sense. I appreciate the initiative that's demonstrated there, right? Like we're not able to gather in in our churches, but we're still finding, you're still finding ways to create community around worship. All right, Rebecca, as the person with the most experience, let's hear from you. Yeah, um, I think the common theme throughout us is exposure to just the diversity of the church. Um, for me, I'm a PK, so that's a pastor's kid. My dad is the pastor of my home church, Northside Community Church in Harare, Zimbabwe. Um, and so I've only ever attended that church um, for the most part, other than when my dad got like a week off and we would visit another church. But this was our community. This was our support system. This church 
um, as Kip mentioned, really was my identity um, and all that I knew church to be. And then coming to Calvin, um, at the beginning of the semester, we have this event called Coaxing Clubs where all the local churches come and like set up these booths. And so me and my roommate walked around to these tables and just collected a wad of brochures to churches that we um, either really liked the people we connected with or were just curious about. And I spent my entire freshman year visiting a different church almost every Sunday. And it just blew my mind um, at just how different worship church could be and could look um and so i think that's really the summary of that entry point into church was just discovering the differences and then having to step back and think about what i wanted in a church was a really hard thing to do because at the beginning I was looking for the church that looked exactly like my church back home and no church looked like my church back home Um, but I was beginning to learn other things and then also developing my own theological background and understanding that informed the way that I was moving into these church spaces moving into chapel spaces bible study spaces And so those deeper conversations continue to frame it and um, continue to shape me even to this day as we encounter um, changes through the pandemic. Um, What does it mean to attend church or not to attend church um, as it has been for the past semester? So yeah, that exposure and exploration of church has been big. Good, thank you. So just going to reiterate that we've heard that um, for most students, they've been at the same church for their whole lives when they come to Calvin. And uh, what we do, particularly in the cohort, but this happens pretty naturally um, outside of that too, is uh, students discover that there are lots of different ways to be the church. And there's no... um, one right way. And that's, uh, as as Rebecca said, kind of mind-blowing and beautiful, but also very disorienting. One of the things we do in the cohort is um, we we try to facilitate that disorientation a little bit um, in saying like, okay, so, you know, I'm going to pick on you a little bit here, Kip. Kip came with um, a difficult experience of church, but not a lot of students do. And so it was actually really important for students to hear that from Kit because um, they can come with this really rosy, like the the church can do no wrong kind of feeling. Um, But we we try to introduce like the, the church can be a source of pain. It's made of human beings and human beings are fallen. And so what do we do with that? Um, and then we explore all these different ways, these all these different good ways that we can be the church. And it's a very rich and life-giving experience. Um, the other, another thing I'm hearing is that you don't wanna be passive consumers. You're all interested in being involved. Um, you know, it's not about performance. It's not about uh, the best music. It's about like, what can I bring? So uh, riffing off that a little bit, uh, how do you understand your role as a college student in the church? Like what what uniquely do you have to bring and what uniquely does the church um, have to offer you? Uh, So um, Kip, could you go first this time? Sure. You know, so so like you said, I, I sort of have a difficult background with the church, a complicated relationship with it. And so I think that for me, a lot of um, coming to understand my my role in the church is learning to love it again, learning to, to want to be a part of it again, where, you know, sort of the, the problem with having eyes is that you can't unsee things, right? And so then you leave this church experience that's painful and all of the things about it that are painful are you know, super obvious to you. Um, and then you go to other churches and you see the same things. And so, you know, there was definitely, I think, a sense of um, dislocation 
from the church for a while. And just like, I didn't know if I could fully throw my weight behind it and be like, yeah, I'm a Christian. And even for a while, I think, and I'm, I'm still, um, still working through a lot of this, frankly, is, you know, sometimes feeling like I have to make a distinction between being Christian and being a Jesus follower. And I don't, I don't love that. And I'm, I'm trying to resist it. Um, but I, I think that trying, you know, for a while I, I did what I think a lot of people would do. And I just sort of tried to distance myself a little bit from the church, try to get some space. And I think that that is a necessary part of the process. But I think that um, the more that I stepped back and the more I tried to ask questions of truth, right? So like what, instead of thinking through what I've been taught, what do I know to be true? What does the Bible actually tell me about what it means to be Christian? The more I realized that, you know, distancing myself from the problem um, isn't really going to fix it, nor is it going to bring healing for me. So it's sort of been the strange wrestling with my desire for justice for the things that um, my family and I went through and having to just remember that um, vengeance is the Lord's and if there is justice to be had, it will be his. Um, but also remembering that the, the most important command is love God and love others. And we can't really, that's not something that we do effectively on our own right? That's, that's not something that I can do in isolation. Um, and so even though I have my misgivings about the church, I think it's important for me to learn to love it again, um, because God is going to use it, whether I agree with it or not. Um, so yeah, I'm still, that's, that's a process. That's not a landing place, um, of trying to learn, um, to not love all of it, right? Because there are things about it that absolutely, um, you know, should be rejected, but put my weight behind it again and, and love God and love others in it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sina, tell us a bit about how you see your role in the church as a college student. Uh, I think I was going to say something similar about it too. Um, most of the time, I think we um, struggle to identify what the church is apart from it being an institution. Um, and so it's really hard to see the people from like apart from the place. And so like trying and learning to love um, it, no matter like the flaws, um, because it is made from like broken people. So we cannot expect um, to have like a perfect church. And I think um, despite the flaws that we see and things that we might not always love about it, um, just loving others and intergenerationally like connecting the church uh, together, like something that I am trying to find my role in. Um, and so I think it takes um, an important decision in a sense uh, to make that intentional um, to to connect the young with the the middle aged and uh, the older generation all together um, and so as um, a college student this is still like something that I'm trying to figure out because I haven't gone to church in person in a really long time and so um, once I start um, being more involved in the church um, physically, um, I think integrating um, other parts of the community together um, and bringing it into the church and taking that space of um, being the voice um, will be something that I want to look into as well. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, the ministry leadership cohort in the second half of their first semester takes a class called Disciplines of the Local Church where we really do focus on um, loving the church and recognizing its flaws. So I'm hearing that come out um, right now, uh, which is a joy and um, and like sad that we have to think about it that way, but, rec but also it helps us move forward in loving the church. And I'm happy to be hearing that. Rebecca, how do you understand your role as a college student in the church? Yeah, I think there definitely is that duality um, in 
being a college student of we're moving into this space um, for me I was new to the country new to churches and so having to refine my place um, within that church and relearning how to exist in that community by seeking mentorship as I was encountering all of these worldview changes and theological um, debates. So seeking that mentorship and support to wrestle through all those really hard things, but then also this desire to be active in the community and playing a part of it, um, wanting to give to the church. Um, being a PK, I did pastors, kids get we get roped into everything. And so I was used to being a part of something. And I moved into a church where no one knew who I was or trusted me. And so learning how to then find my place in service. Um, so stepping up into children's ministry, going to soup kitchens, things like that, I still wanted to play that active role. But it took time in order to kind of build that community and that trust and so it's a bit of that giving and receiving tension I think as a college student where you're learning you're learning but also I have something to share and give as well so yeah thank you for sure yeah so I think that um you know broadly speaking I don't want to generalize completely but college students are in a in a very unique phase of their life where they're not very experienced. Um, they haven't, you know, had the, they haven't put on very many decades of, of church experience yet, but uh, they're also in a situation where they're being constantly trained to absorb an overwhelming amount of information in a very small amount of time, um, which is just, you know, prime conditions for learning. Um, so I do consider myself primarily uh, a learner as a college student. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I, I don't, again, for different college students, this could vary by a lot. There could be um, situations where you're doing a lot more teaching uh, than others. But I think generally, and especially for myself, I think that college is a is definitely a time for learning both uh, in academia and also in the church. Um, personally, I also see myself as a, as a server um, or as a servant rather, um, I mean, that was the, that was the biggest reason why I left my previous church was because I didn't really have a place, um, to serve. I didn't have a place where my, uh, my desires could meet the church's needs, um, in a way that I felt was, was right for me. So, um, I, you know, at the church that I'm at now, at the time when I first attended, they didn't have a pianist. So all of their worship was either accompanied by a single violinist or complete lack, completely a cappella. Um, so the very first Sunday that I visited there, I played for their worship and I've been serving there every single Sunday um, since. And that's a huge, huge part of my life. Um, I mean, that's both church life and just life in general. Um, service is incredibly important to me. So uh, those are how I see myself in this stage of life. And I don't think either of those things will ever truly go away, um, but they might shift and morph over time. Yeah, good perspective. I love that. It's like classic church plant, like, welcome. We need you to do something. It's, if, you, if you want a place to serve, go to a church plant. Um, I, I think what I heard overall, but especially from Rebecca is but when you, you know, we've mentioned this a little bit already or, or alluded to it, that when you go to college, you really have to make your, your church life your own, right? You've sort of been able to ride on your parents' coattails before that, um, but you have to own it. And I hear a lot of initiative taking um, during a time of great transition. So that's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud of you for taking that initiative, but also recognizing um, and maybe what we need others to hear is like college students are trying really hard. They're taking initiative. Um, so please be open to that if you're at a church and you're uh, finding yourself welcoming college students in. All right. So you, you all mentioned in some form learning. 
um, you know, during this unique time, this four years, when you're a college student, you have a, a strong learning posture. Um, and I think we could, we could launch that into sort of the, a corollary question of what, how do you see the role of other generations in the church? If you're a learner and a, and a servant, what, what is, is there a unique role that other generations have to play? Uh, so Sana, would you be willing to start us off? Of course, yes. Um, I think one, one thing that I could have mentioned earlier too is like um, hospi hospitality and like mm -hmm. that sense of community should be like a role that every um, generation within the church should take on, um, especially at this time where like, it's really hard for a lot of families um, to maintain that economical and a lot of other aspects. Um, but on top of that also, I think each generation also has their own kind of role within the church. Um, one thing that I found is like most of the time um, I've had um, people who have had like more experiences than I have as mentors. Um, and it's it's helped my spiritual life a whole lot because I would be um, trampled with questions sometimes and I would just go and ask and just be um, myself in that sense. Um, for the younger generation, um, I feel as though like they kind of keep us um, responsible, like more so we want to be role models for them when we see it from their perspective. So for example, let's say um, I have a five-year-old brother um, and if I know that he's watching my actions and my words every day, I am more so leaning towards, oh, he's going to see this and he's probably going to do it again another time. So I have to watch my words and my actions in front of him. Um, in that same sense, I think um, especially students that are in high school and middle school um, kind of keep us college students a little more on that responsible sense, uh, then we can model for them what it could be like to be um, a Christian and to show that within our actions as well. Thank you. Thanks for including both sides of that from your own location um, generationally. Fisher, tell us about how you see other generations. Yeah, um, so I really like what Santa said about hospitality. Um, that's something that's been super prominent for, for me in my own church. Um, and, you know, wel welcoming in someone for, for a home-cooked meal is, I think, one of the kindest things that you can do and one of the most welcoming things that you can do. Um, and, you know, I can, I can only view the older generation from my own standpoint as a learner. Um, so primarily I view them as teachers, uh, though I'm sure the, the learning aspect never goes away. And I'd love to, you know, hear uh, what the older generations think of, of themselves and see if it's um, primarily emphasized by, if they primarily emphasize teaching or learning. Um, but from my own perspective, I view them as, as teachers um, having a lot more experience uh, than we do and being able to uh, counsel us on different situations in our own life that they might have gone through before, um, you know, advising us not to do certain things or, you know, kind of just watching us fail and being there for us when, when we do. And um, yeah, so I view them as, as mentors and teachers and for the younger generation. Um, and this has been a, this has been a very prominent point of learning for myself as um, I kind of, learn more about the practice of infant baptism um, and the beauty of it. And uh, just kind of realizing that children are an essential part of the church and they're baptized into the church. And um, I, I view them as primarily as reminders of God's covenant faithfulness, um, that he is, he is faithful to us throughout our whole lives um, and that he will never stop providing for us. Um, and also, like like Santa said, a point of responsibility to, um, to you know, guide them and teach them, um, and strive so that they may not have a day in their life where they didn't know Christ as their Lord and Savior. Um, so yeah, 
Amen. Rebecca, tell us about how you uh, see the role of other generations in the church. Yeah, I think the it is so important to have that spectrum. Um, even if just as a college kid, the only place I see families is church. Um, but I think in terms of like the growth of the church, I think it's so important as often the younger children um, are disruptors. They are um, provide the simplicity and the joy within worship spaces um, that I think can sometimes break the rigidity that can exist as we get into our traditions, our ways. Um, but the older generation is needed in order to provide that guidance, that structure in which to approach those spaces. Um, and so I think every generation is kind of feeding off their own. For me as a college student, the retired folk is, is a generation that I'm extremely grateful for because they will often take me to Maya to do groceries or cook meals. Um, they uh, really are able to invest in people, but then being able to have mentors from all walks of life, whether they're entering the workforce, leaving that workforce, help and spiritual development is such a blessing. Um, and so I think all of them kind of feed into each other and allow the growth is the biggest thing for me um, as they challenge and um, support each other in that. Great. Thanks for highlighting that interdependence that's present in many ways, not just intergenerationally. All right, Kip, how do you understand the role of other generations in the church? Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty, my, my idea of it is pretty similar to a lot of what's been said before about mentorship, where I, I think ideally there wouldn't be, it wouldn't feel like there's a significant difference between generations and how they participate in the church. You know, I, I think that our practices have to adapt over time, right? Like the specifics of how, you know, we go about um, working in a community or sometimes the specifics of how we worship. Sometimes those do have to change. But I think ideally um, between generations, a certain posture would be maintained, a certain way of approaching the gospel and thinking about it where, you know, sometimes the specifics change, but the heart and the intention is still the same. And so... Yeah, I think mentorship is really, should really only, should really be the only difference in my mind is just that obviously older people are going to mentor younger people and that's just how it's going to go. But we all sort of work together, even across those generations with a common heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the, the way you talked about it as a posture, a posture of mentorship. And what I'm hearing is mentorship occurs among you know, older people mentor younger people. And of course, you know, the learning goes both ways. Um, but that everybody has a role to play in terms of serving the church and leading in the church, right? So when you say that's the only difference is mentorship, I think what you're saying then is that everybody has a, a role to play otherwise. Great, thanks. Um, let me just reiterate food. At CICW, we believe good things happen over food, right? Like there's there's these you know theological overtones of the fe the the feast and Lord's Supper, but we know that like food just facilitates community. So if you want to be in community with college students, feed them. Plus, it's fun. All right. I would like to hear from you. I think maybe the the key question. Um, why? Like, why is it important to you to be connected to the institution of church, like to a distinct worshiping community? Why is that important to you? Um, so Kip, can I go back to you, even though you just, you just wrapped up? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think in many ways, that's the, the big why question is what I've been asking for the last few years, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's like, why, why should this thing that has caused me, you know, this much pain or has put me through this, why should I continue to be a part of it or what good is it serving and things like that. And 
I don't know. There's not like a, like a straightforward answer to that question as much as I, I think it is, it is a command to be a part of church. You know, like I said, I do see it as part of loving God and loving others, but I also, I just think about the whole way that the new Testament is structured is that it's um, it is embodied, right? It is um, Jesus has a physical ministry that is about feeding people. That is about healing people. That is about being with people, even with sinners um, or even with the most um, unqualified or lowly of um, people. Uh, You know, when we read Paul's letters, specific churches, he's not talking to a you, he's talking to a you all. Um, There is a, there is an embodiment to church that just, I think is undeniable, right? The gospel will be embodied. And I think even when we look back on the old Testament, one of the most repeated phrases in the prophets is talking about, um, the way that Israel treated the orphan and the widow and the foreigner. Um, And that is not something that happens in sort of a lofty abstract theology. That's about doctrine. That's something that happens in feet washing and breaking of bread and things like that. And so I think it's unavoidable um, when I look at scripture to not see that the church has to be, a part of Christianity. You know, like I said, I think sometimes I've had, I've, I've felt like I've had to make a distinction between being a Jesus follower and being a Christian, but to be a Jesus follower means to be in a church, means to be in a community. Um, and that doesn't, you know, I don't think that that means that I totally agree with everything. I don't, I don't think that that's the point that I would totally agree with everything, but I think that, um, you know, once again, I just, I think about Jesus eating with sinners, with tax collectors and prostitutes, with Samaritan women at wells and things like that. And it's not about the perfection of people. It's not about the overall moral goodness of people. Um, He showed up anyway. So why church? Because I I think I, I don't see a way to be a Jesus follower without being in a church. And I also recognize that I, I think that that, um, going back and fully investing in a church is going to be an important part of me actually leaving behind some of the pain that I felt is going to sort of be a final, maybe not a final, um, but a necessary, um, part of me leaving some of my past behind and actually forgiving people and healing and things like that. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks. You just named a whole bunch of things that the church is good for like that the church that makes the church the church forgiving eating together justice um and that's beautiful and we do it wrong sometimes Mm -hmm. more than sometimes um and yet jesus pulls us back um and says you know let me teach you how to do this right yeah thank you signa why why is it important to you to be part of the church Okay, I think I'm going to circle back to um, what we've been learning in uh, ministry leadership cohort last semester. We talked about how the small church, which is the local church, fits into the perspective of the global church. And so I think being a part of church on a smaller level kind of connects us to people who are across borders, people who are made in the image of God, and they are... um, all brothers and sisters in the, in, in the image of God. And um, we are able to connect with that in a sense. Um, for example, um, my DCM class is learning about refugees at the moment. Um, and so the welcoming part, even historically, when you see it, church started um, welcoming other people um, who are helpless. Um, and so um, before it was taken into non uh, denominational NGOs and everything else, it, it initiated within the church. And so that welcoming and hospitality aspect of church is what kind of draws me in. Um, at the same time, my other um, point is that um, it is a grounding space. Um, the church, it kind of 
lets us be like gathered in one place, but at the same time to be able to fulfill what Jesus Christ calls us to do, to go into the world and proclaim the name of Christ. Um, I think at, at the back of my head, always, I know that there is um, a place where I can be, this is where I can find God and be to be able to spread that into the rest of the world as well. Um, and then there is the community aspect of it too. It's not just like a social club. It is more than that because um, we're all like gathered in the name of Christ and um, we're able to um, fulfill those callings when we are together as well. Yeah. Amen. Rebecca, tell us about why church for you? I think the thread of community um, is really the foundation for me, um, especially being international and moving to this, literally my life up and lifted to come to college. And so finding a church was a grounding space for me um, because there were people that just loved you and I didn't necessarily have to do much or prove myself um, in any sense. And so there was a lot of comfort in that. And then these individuals, you know, would follow up with you in the week. How can we be praying for you? And just to know that there's people out there um, supporting you on your journey um, has been really foundational. And so that fellowship, that community, um, has meant everything to me and I think really helped me find my place um, here in America and in Grand Rapids as yeah we kind of lean into that but then also looking for the ways in which my faith um, what my role was and so paying attention to how I was integrated into the church um, kind of reflected on what the future may look like as I was wrestling through the hardships of the church. And so I was paying attention to the institution um, on like the global scale, the leadership a little bit more than I think I did growing up. It was more looking at those nuances and structure rather than um, faith development. So it was kind of a bit of both. Great. Thank you. I heard it. I heard the phrase grounding space from both Sena and Rebecca. And that's just really uh, interesting. I'm just going to let that sit for a moment while we hear from Fisher. Yeah. So I think there's, there's a multitude of benefits that, that the church has for its people um, alongside all of the, all the pain that it can cause. I think there's um, even as an institution, the church is, um, can be a great thing for people. Like personally, um, you know, like another point of commonality between Kip and I is that I was also homeschooled, um, up until college. And yeah, that was, that was my, that was my whole social, um, outlet. And I mean, it was, uh, it was a great thing in a lot of ways. I, I still keep in touch with a lot of people from that church or, um, you know, from the community, community events that we would hold and stuff like that. So, um, there's, there's that, there's financial support that it can offer to people in need. There's, um, this profound welcoming in of, of people who, um, have been shut out and, you know, all those things, maybe not across churches, um, completely, but I think that's, you know, an ideal function of the church. Um, but even then, I don't think that's what, um, my answer to why church is because, I don't think that it's about us or about what we can receive, um, but instead how we can share um, in that community and how we can contribute to it. Um, and like Kip said, it's it's a biblical command. It's seen the act of corporate worship is seen throughout the Old Testament under the Mosaic Covenant. It's fulfilled in Christ um, as our eternal high priest, and it's carried on throughout the New Testament in the in the early churches. And I think that. Um, as you read the scripture, corporate worship is, is a clear non-negotiable. Um, and, you know, at, in the current online environment that we're in, that's a really, <clears throat> that's a, that makes a lot of really tough questions um, 
for people who can't go to church in person or whose churches aren't live streaming. Um, I know those are probably pretty rare nowadays, but um, situations like that where you can't really, um, you know, it's hard to participate in the body of Christ because of, you know, the, the global pandemic that's going on. I mean, that's a serious, serious issue. And that's a lot of, brings up a lot of very, very hard questions. Um, but I think rejecting the church for the sake of it being the church, um, you know, uh, otherwise all online situations uh, disregard it. I think that that is, you know, I, I think it kind of cuts against what being a Christian is. Um, and I really think that the church is, is a very essential part of it. Um, to have a relationship with Christ, you really you kind of need to have a relationship with his body and be a part of that. Um, so that's what it comes down to for me is that it's inherent to my faith. It's not, it's not being, or it can't be separated from being a Christian. Um, it's an integral part of it. Yeah. Thank you. So one thing I heard you say, I think you sort of allude to Fisher is um, you said it's about, it's not about us. It's focused on God. It's responding to God. And, but yet you also refer to all these benefits to us, right? So there's this like overflow uh, of what happens. Like, it's like a we fought, we obey God and we are church together, and yet we learn how to be good Jesus followers by being connected to the church. Um, but that's not our primary reason for going. It's just a beautiful, like, complicated way that things um, that God uses the church, and uh, I love it. I think so. One thing I'm hearing, or if I were to sum up what I'm hearing from you is there's a convictional aspect, like God has commanded us to be part of the church. And I am convicted of that. And there's also an experiential aspect of, and yet when I do follow that command, this is what I experience. I experience community. I experience the love of God. I experience the love of my neighbor. I experience a grounding space. I experience home. Um, and those things uh, come together. Um, those things are best when they're, they are together. If you're just in it for the experience, as soon as the experience is tough, um, you just walk away. Um, but if but if the experience, but if you're convicted, it gives you this uh, energy, this motivation to work it out. But if you're just in it for the conviction, but there's no experience, it's back to that. Um, one of you said something about like rigidity. Um, this wasn't the context in which you were using it, but there's this sort of, there's no life to it. So conviction and experience go hand in hand here. We're coming to the end of our time. Um, I'm wondering, Rebecca, Sena, Kip, Fisher, if you have any last comments, having heard from each other now, uh, having articulated uh, your understanding of church yourself, is there anything you wanna leave us with? All right, you've said your piece. <laughs> okay. I'm I'm gonna wrap us up then, but flag me down if there is something that you um, want to say. Uh, I do want to express my profound gratitude to the four of you, Rebecca, Sena, Kip, and Fisher. I am so grateful that you've been willing to be vulnerable with us here, that you've been willing to share your experience in service of God and the church. Uh, I want to end by just reminding you of the ministry leadership cohort that all these students are a part of. Um, Students interview for a place in the cohort during their senior year of high school. And then the cohort is part of their transition into Calvin. So if you know a high school sophomore or junior at this point who would be a good fit for the ministry leadership cohort, please let us know by filling out a nomination form on the 
um, ministry leadership cohort webpage, which is dropped in the chat. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we hope that this has sparked a good conversation um, and good insights for you about how your church can love and interact with college students. Go in peace.